We're back into 1 Corinthians, and for the next month or so, uh, we're going to be um, finishing off 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and then tackling all of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And there are some difficult, relationally difficult parts of the next couple of months. So we will be talking about sex, we're going to be talking about marriage, we're going to be talking about singleness, we're going to be talking about divorce. Uh, we, we have a, a lot of different categories that Paul speaks to, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to speak to uh, about how we, how we live and operate as the body of Christ. What does, this, what does it look like to be a holy people, to be a set-apart people, the family of God, distinct from the world, a window for the world into the world as it could be, living in under God's righteous rule and reign and, and pursuing his order, rather than a mirror just reflecting society back to itself. So that's going to be basically the next month or so. And uh, some of the topics may be more difficult than others. Um, some of them might be uh, particularly kind of uh, impacting for you personally. My hope is that all of us, we want to be shaped and moulded by Scripture into the likeness of Jesus, that so we see not only what does his people look like, what do his people look like, but also we see in that the character and the nature of God reflected in his people. And so, uh, again, my hope is that even though they're going to be perhaps like last week we looked at lawsuits and that might be pertinent for some and hopefully not for many people going forward, uh, although the principles are helpful for all of us, uh, over the next couple of weeks I know for sure that there are going to be some topics that are going to be very touchy, uh, shall we say. And so... Uh, again, my hope is that God's going to do a really great work among us, that our minds would conform to the mind of Christ, would gain the mind of Christ as we get into his scriptures, as we become more like him, as we think more like him and love more like him and relate more like him and forgive like he forgives and love like he loves. That's the hope. So, uh, well, to say, let me start with 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to finish off the chapter today. Uh, let me read. This is what it says. Everything is permissible for me. What a great way to start a sentence and a thought. I can do anything I want. But not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me. But I will not be mastered by anything. Man, if we can get this today, I think it's going to be awesome for us. Personally and for us as the body of Christ here in Plimpton. Food is for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will do away with both of them. However, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are part of Christ's body? So should I take a part of Christ's body and make it a part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For scripture says, the two will become one flesh. But anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. Let's pray. Our Father, again, we need your help in understanding these words, inspired by you, written down by Paul, to the church in Corinth and for us today, 2,000 years later, and say, help us. We don't want to be ignorant of your ways. We don't want to be ignorant of your character, of your work in the world, of your desire for us. We don't want to be ignorant of the way you are ordering the world and our part in it. And so, Father, would you help us have open hearts, open minds, focused attention on your scriptures today, on you today, as you speak to us, as you minister to us, that we would go away more like Jesus, in whose name we ask. Amen. So again, Paul starts this with a phenomenal, like we understand what he's saying here, it is mind-blowing, because often people especially people outside the church, but even people inside the church, uh, possibly in particular people who have grown up in certain cultures and perhaps through Sunday school programs where kids are 
moralized and not gospeled, perhaps. That we get the idea that God is a, is a God of rules and the scriptures, is, the scriptures are a collection of books or a book, a rule book of this is how we should live our lives and because we're always missing the mark, we can never live up to it. We feel bad about our inability to live up to it so we just stop reading it, which makes us feel less bad about us missing the mark. And so we've, we are, we're kind of trapped in this rut of a moral deism where we think that God just wants us to follow the rules. And if we follow the rules, we somehow, we found a cosmic loophole or we twist his arm and then he has to love us because we follow the rules. And that's not what the Bible is about at all. It's not what God's about at all. No, I shouldn't say it's not what he's at all. I say there's a, ma- there's a tiny overlap actually in that kind of understanding with the truth of the matter. And that is God has ordered the world. So we read in, in the very first chapter of the Bible is God bringing order from disorder and then he creates humans, ordered in his order. And then he says to them, your job is to go and fill the world and bring order to the world. It's wonderful. God's will and his love and his creation and his ways are phenomenal. And when we don't, live up to them, or we treat, the, we treat the Bible as a rule book, we come to something like this and say, everything is permissible for me, and we go, what does that mean? That doesn't sound right at all, actually. I thought there were lots of things that weren't permissible for me. In fact, Paul's given us whole lists of these things already in this letter, saying if you do this, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. And so how does he say everything is permissible for me? We have covered this a little bit. He's saying, man, because of the wonder of grace, because of the phenomenal nature of the mercy of God in Christ towards us, that in the death of Jesus, what he accomplished on the cross is a substitutionary death. He dies the death that I deserve. He bears the penalty for my sin so that I don't do that anymore. And the blood that he shed has covered over every sin, all guilt, all shame, covered by the precious blood of Jesus. But like Paul writes to the Romans, where he says, grace is so amazing, therefore do we go on sinning so that grace can shine all the greater? He says, hell no, we don't do that. We're a new creation. We're new people with new nature, new heart. Just because every sin is covered doesn't mean we then go on embracing the old ways that bring dishonor to God and are bad for us, bring disorder in the world. It's the, it's the inverse, it's the opposite of what God has invited us into as his people. And so Paul writes, everything's permissible for me because the people in Corinth <laughs> they were living some shocking lives like we've looked at already in this letter. Says everything's permissible, well sure, But, so he's not diminishing grace at all. He's saying grace is phenomenal, grace is wonderful. The the love and the mercy of Jesus are almost, I mean, they are fully incomprehensible to us, but we can understand as much as we need. He says, but not everything's beneficial. Just because I can do something, even if it's not sin. Just because I have the freedom to do something doesn't mean it's good to do doesn't mean I should do it. Just because I can do it, doesn't mean I should do it. And that, that's in relation to sin. It's in, in relation to things that aren't sinful as well. And he goes on and gives us another category. He says, man, everything's permissible for me. Again, grace is phenomenal. I can do whatever I want. But I won't be mastered by anything. See, so we have been free. from. We were slaves to sin. Again, he writes to the Romans. You were slaves. You were bound, you were tethered, you were chained to sin. You could not not sin. Now you've been freed and now we're we're chained to righteousness. You, You are righteous. God has made you positionally, relationally, you are righteous before a holy God. Chained to righteousness. Slaves to righteousness, he says. 
So, so then we go back and tether ourselves to sin? We can't do that. So I won't be mastered by anything. We're freed by that. How can I come and subject myself to those things once again? Can't do it, won't do it, he says. And he gives an example. He says, food is for the stomach and stomach is for food. So again, God has created the world with a particular order in his creative and majestic goodness He's made our body to need food. So we need food. It fuels us. Fuels us for activity, fuels us for repair, fuels us to think, fuels us to relate, that everything we do is in some capacity dependent on the fact that we have at some stage in recent history eaten food. I mean, genuinely this morning, uh, I did not have breakfast and I got here and I was like, it's gonna be, it's a mistake for me to try to preach if I haven't had some food. And so I've got some food because, because we need food. God has made our bodies for food. It satisfies us, albeit temporarily, because our bodies are made for food. But in his goodness, God's also made food for the body, which is wonderful. Plants, animals, minerals, not just for fuel, although they do fuel us, but also for taste, for delight, for goodness. Man, I I am a big fan of food. I am very thankful to God for making the body for food and food for the body. Genuinely, in its right, like good order, food is amazing and wonderful. Uh, You see pictures of heaven where there is Food, like glorious kinds of food. When the Israelites were wandering through the desert looking forward to the promised land, what was the, what was the things that made it amazing? It was food. Flowing with milk and honey. Wonderful, amazing. Food is great. I love most kinds of meat, cooked most kinds of ways, uh, baked goods of all kinds of varieties. Uh, man, f- spice, all kinds of spices. F- I love food, man. Food is amazing. But Paul gives us this warning. So food is a wonderful gift from God. In his created order, the body is for food and the food is for the body. He says, but not everything is beneficial for me. I can do anything. I can eat anything, but not everything is beneficial for me. We'll go into this in greater detail in a few chapters time. Uh, into food in particular. Uh, for me, thinking of beneficial things, uh, if I cast my mind back a year ago, perhaps 50 to 70% of my diet was fried foods, some sort of fried foods, fried chicken, uh, chips. I'd have, yeah, four, five meals of fried chicken a week. Uh, it's kind of, potato chips was just my kind of default, potato chips. Uh, turns out, although that was permissible for me, it was not beneficial for me. <laughs> When I went to the doctor and he said, you have ridiculously high cholesterol and very dangerously high blood pressure. And so I haven't, I haven't eaten fried chicken in nearly a year. I haven't had potato chips. Like I said, 50 to 70% of my diet, maybe 80%, I, I don't really know. If you include ice cream, maybe less. Um, seed oils, like barely as much as I can avoid it in the last year. Because not, although everything is permissible, not everything is beneficial and it not, might not... Uh, it might not kind of stray into the, the territory of sin, but it is in the territory of not beneficial. And if we embrace things that are, we, that are knowingly un, like not beneficial or, or are knowingly destructive or knowingly embrace a disordering rather than an ordering of our lives, then we actually get into the arena of like sinful dishonoring of God. And we'll we'll get to how that looks in a minute. Because some of us have an unhelpful, non-beneficial relationship with food. Paul helps us understand here, he says, I won't be, not everything is beneficial, but also I won't be mastered by anything either. So some of us are mastered by our stomachs. You're mastered by anything or anyone who has the power over you to say you can't or you must. And so if food or, like Paul writes elsewhere, he says, you know, for some 
our stomachs are our God. When they tell us we have to do something, we want to eat, we've got to eat, we have to do it. When they tell us we can't do it, we don't do it. He says, man, I, I'm not going to be mastered by anything. And I think, for me, one of, this is one of the most powerful things about fasting. The fasting says, it does a lot of things. You know, it's not just a, a sense of spiritual quickening. It's not just because Jesus said to do it, and so, and so we do it out of obedience. It is those things. But it's not just those things. It's also us, like prophetically speaking to our bodies, our instinct, our cravings, our desires, our attractions, and our proclivities. We are speaking to ourselves prophetically in our fasting, saying, you're not in charge. That's what, that's what fasting does. It's similar with, with tithing. It's where we say to our money, or just generosity generally, you are not my boss. My wallet is not my God. My stomach is not my God. It says I'm not going to be mastered by anything. Rather, we say to our desires, our cravings, our fleshly proclivities, we say to them, you are not my master. I already have a master. So Paul writes, you have already been purchased. You're not your own. It's not to make us feel bad. It's to make us feel great. We've been redeemed by the God who is love. He made everything, who knows everything, who, whose desire for us is joy and joy to the full and order and eternal life and life to the full. He's the one that bought us. Not our flesh. Rather, instead of our flesh being our master, instead of our stomachs or food or, or our internal attractions or desires or cravings being our master. And man, it's not to say you can't see a really delicious looking cake or fried chicken or whatever and, and have an attraction to that thing or have a desire for that thing or have a craving for that thing. But what we do is we bridle our desires and we steer them where we want them to go. We actually steer our desires to Jesus. We steer our proclivities to Jesus. We steer our cravings to Jesus. We steer our stomachs to Jesus. So we need to exercise our mastery over our bodies. One of the things, um, it's been like pumping around the uh, social media reels recently, uh, there's been this study that, that came out in the last couple of years talking about, if you're a biologist or a neurobiologist, you're going to hate my pronunciation of this, but uh, the anterior mid cingulate cortex, or the AMCC, which is how I'm now going to refer to it, this little thing like right in the middle, kind of can't point to it because it's in the middle there in between the hemispheres. And uh, supposedly what this research has found, this part of the body relates to tenacity and resistance to temptation, to willpower, to responding to challenge and resilience. And what they found was a larger AMCC, this little part of the brain, little part of the body, correlates with increased discipline. So if it's larger, you are, it correlates with increased discipline, people achieving goals, lower anxiety, and a greater tenacity. So a drive to overcome challenges to do the thing you want to do. A smaller AMCC correlates with increased apathy, depression, and reduced motivational capacities. Don, why are you bringing this up? Here's why. Study also found that when you do hard things or things you don't want to do, if you apply discipline and decide to do the thing and go do the thing, this little part of your body that correlates with doing hard things and tenacity and discipline grows, which helps you to be more disciplined, more tenacious, and to do the things you want to do. And so it's this, it's this reciprocal thing of, they found people who, uh, it tends to be, in this study, they found people with obesity tend to have a smaller AMCC, but when those people go on a diet, it starts to grow. Athletes have typically a larger AMCC. People who are already disciplined have a larger AMCC, which then leads to greater discipline in other areas of their lives. So when Paul writes, I won't be mastered by anything. Here's an example, food. If I can not be mastered by food, but rather become food's master, 
what the modern science is telling us is that doesn't just help us in that regard, it helps us in all of our life. It brings order through discipline and hard things. One of the things I've been saying to my kids since they were old enough to understand is, we're reddens and we do hard things. Wait, that, that's one of our kind of catch cries as a family. Beck introduced a new one this year, which is when one of our kids says, I don't want to do this. Beck says, what's the big but? Because it makes them laugh and remember it. I don't want to do this, but it's good for me. But I am a disciplined person, so I'm going to go do it. Like, what is the, what is the big but? Has been, a, has been a new uh, feature in our family because, not that we knew all this stuff, but even just from this 2,000 year old collection of books that we know were written by humans inspired by the Holy Spirit, they taught us don't be mastered by anything. We already have a master. And so we bridle our desires, we engage our discipline. We have not been given a spirit of fear or timidity, but of self control. So we exercise our self-control. And even our physiology changes as this part of our body grows, which then helps us to be tenacious, helps us to achieve our goals, helps us to overcome adversity, helps us to master other things and not be mastered by them. We were made this way. It's God's phenomenal order to us. Getting food right will help us to get the rest right. Being disciplined in one area bleeds into other areas of our life. And the inverse works too. When we lack discipline or we don't do those things we want to do, physiologically we change as well. That area shrinks, which makes us less able to say no the next time. If we give in to mastery, we give in to the flesh, we give in to sin, we go, we tether again, it becomes harder the next time to overcome that sin. It's one of the reasons God has gloriously and graciously put us into community with one another so we can spur one another on to love and to good works. We can encourage each other. We can say, let's pursue Jesus together. Let's go for it. We're free to do as we please. But now that we're a new creation, we've been given a new nature, a new heart. We don't want to use our freedom to sin and fall back into error anymore. Or even if it's just foolishness or, or, or unhelpfulness, that may lead them to sin later on. We're not driven anymore by self-indulgence or self-gratification or letting our fleshly desires drive our lives. We have bridled those desires and we direct them where we want them to go. So Paul writes, food is for the stomach, the stomach for food, and God will do, God will do away with both of them. So here's something that was made for your body and your body for it, and even that will come to an end. He says, but the body is not. So the body is for food, food for, food, food for the body, but the body is not, he says, for sexual immorality. So here we have this wonderful, ordered, God has made it phenomenal, and it is, it is amazing. Like again, we don't want to err into idolatry to say that food is, is more than it is, but in its right place, food is phenomenal. And it, but he says, but sexual immorality, the body's not for that. The body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So Paul starts with how we use our bodies with food to show us something good as part of good, you know, God's good created order. And then he moves back to how we use our bodies for sex. If you remember last week, we started to look at, Paul started to talk about how we use our bodies for sex. Next week and for the next couple of weeks, sex will feature as well because the people in Corinth were leading a disordered sex life. And that's why Paul brings it up. He says, like food, we well, didn't say this, he says this other place, he says, like food, sex is a wonderful gift from God. And like food, we can have a disordered relationship with how we view and how we engage in sex. So if we just very quickly look at last week, because again, again, remember, this is one letter that would have been read in big chunks or all together. So we don't want to abstract this week from last week or from next week. So let's just very quickly go over the last bit from last week. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous won't inherit God's kingdom? It says, don't be deceived. People are going to try to tell you it doesn't matter what you do with your bodies. They're going to try to tell you, oh, God said this, but that's, 
That's 2,000 years old way of thinking, man. We're way more enlightened now. That's God's created order. Oh, that sounds like, that sounds like rules, man. Be free. Come be free like me. He says, don't be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this. Does he used to live like this when you were tethered to the flesh? When you weren't tethered to righteousness, when you know, everything was permissible for me, but not everything was helpful for me, or I was mastered by other things, you used to do these kinds of things, he says. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. You were sanctified. You were set apart. You were made distinct from the world around you. You have the stamp of of Jesus on your life. You have the guarantee and the deposit. You have the Holy Spirit in you, marking you. Jesus says, you're mine. I saved you. He says, you live differently now to the world. He's already said a few weeks ago, we don't look down on the world for sinning differently than we do or for not being able to overcome sin or overcome mastery in a way that we weren't able to before we had the Holy Spirit of discipline and a new nature. We don't look down on them. We don't judge the world. God, that's God's job. We don't look, we don't look down on people, but God has separated us. He's made us distinct and holy. And he says, you've been justified, which means God doesn't hold your sin against you anymore. You've been washed clean. Not a clean slate. Now go and try to not dirty your slate again but you've been imputed with the righteousness of Jesus. It's not as if you've done nothing wrong. It's just as if you've done everything right. It's wonderful. The love and the grace of God is phenomenal. It says you used to live like this, but we don't anymore. And he calls out a few kinds of disordered sexual use of our bodies. The first he just says sexually immoral people. It's a kind of a, it's a big umbrella term. Meaning any kind of sexual activity that doesn't honor God. It really boils down to sex which is just for the gratification of my flesh. Any kind of selfish sex I think is in this. It's, uh, it's living outside of God's order. The way that he says, I've made you for this and this is wonderful. Live like this. And then when he sets us apart, he invites us to live like this and he enables us to live like this and when we live like this again we give a window to the world of what the world could look like under the righteous rule and reign of Jesus when we live in his order that's what we're talking about here not looking down on other people for living differently but because we've been invited into God's holiness set apartness to live a different kind of way. Could be sex before marriage. Could be selfish or abusive sex in marriage. The Greek word here is porneo, which obviously you'd immediately recognize as one of the words where we get pornography from. And if you think about what porn does, it flattens another human being robs them of their dignity, robs them of their worth, robs them of their meaning, robs them of their value to all that's left is just some, an object for my self-gratification. And this is the same kind of vibes Paul is getting at here when he talks about sexual immorality. There's nothing else other than for my sexual arousal, sexual satisfaction, the same vein of thinking Paul has in mind when he uses the term sexual immorality. It covers a lot. The second category is adulterers, those who haven't kept sex only for their spouse or someone who has sexually entered into somebody else's marriage. Paul says, we, we don't do that as God set apart people. The third is men who have sex with men. Paul uses very specific language here where some people in our day who are trying to do the deceiving that Paul warns of earlier said, I oh, doesn't really mean that. That's not what he really means. It's very specific language. Talking about, without getting graphic, givers and receivers 
of male to male sexual relationship. It's very explicit and he says, that is outside of God's good order. And he invites us, says, some of you are like this, now we need to bridle our affections, bridle our desires and direct them to Jesus. And this is a hard word, this is very countercultural, uh, you know, bordering into the, into the risk of being cancelled kind of category, but it's the word of God and we do not mess around with it. He do, note, he doesn't call out the, the man who, is, who has a romantic or sexual attraction to another man, but who has bridled their desires and takes it to Jesus. He doesn't call that person out. He calls out the person who tethers themselves again to slavery to sin and engages in that kind of sexual activity. Do you, under, do you understand that distinction? The one who is, has the same sex attraction but honours God with his or her body, uh, I think is doing a wonderful God-honouring thing. That would be absolutely celebrated. In fact, we'll, we'll probably talk about that in the next couple of weeks as well. Again, it's why, for a Christian, the, I was born this way, it doesn't, Paul would say, yeah. And Jesus would say, maybe, but you must be born again. And I'm inviting you to live this way. This is the way that honors me. This is the way that brings me glory. Again, it's why Paul says, just like with food made for the body and the body made for food, the body is for the Lord. The body is for the Lord. And the Lord for the body, not for sexual immorality. And the Lord being for our body, there's, there's connotations there about communion, which we'll, again, we'll look at later in Corinthians as well. But the Lord's also talking about the Lord being for our body also speaks to our union with Jesus. We are united with him. He hasn't just saved us, wiped the slate clean and then said, go and live a good life now. He hasn't just brought us from death to life. He has done both those things. He hasn't just brought us from the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom. He hasn't just brought us into his family and adopted us as sons and daughters. He has unified us with Jesus. Where the Bible talks about we are hidden in Christ. That's the level of our union with Jesus. Where Jesus prays in John 17, Father, I pray that they will be one just like you and I are one. That's beautiful. The same, we're the same kind of union. So Paul writes and says, man, marriage, the, the marriage of a man and woman relates to the mystery of the union between Jesus and his bride, us, the church. We talks about two becoming one flesh. There's a sense of union and oneness that's not the same, but it foreshadows or, sh or shadows or speaks to, in a prophetic kind of sense, the relationship that Jesus has with us, with his bride. That we are one with him. And so Paul says, how can we take Jesus, who is holy, and his bride, who he has made holy, take the union of the Holy One of Heaven and His Holy Bride and then take our flesh and join it with something unholy. So what a, what a disastrous, dishonouring to God to do that. He says, we don't do that. We don't live like that. He says, God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Don't you know that your body is a part of Christ's body? Unified. Part of Christ's body in that we're members of the church, which is the body of Christ. Part of Christ's body in that we partake of his body each week around the communion table. And again, part of Christ's body in that we are united with him, hidden in him, sealed in him forever, which is why Paul confidently writes, so flee sexual immorality. Don't play cute with it. Don't say, oh, what's the line so I can go right up to the line? He says, run away, flee, get away from it. It's not helpful. It is succumbing to mastery. Again, it's gratifying the, 
flesh again. He says, no, no, no. We used to live like that, but we don't anymore. God's people live like this and he invites us to live like this. So flee sin. He saved us. Given us a new life, made us a new creation, brought us into his kingdom, into his family, into union with him. He's made us holy and we want to live as holy people. He set us apart and so we live as set apart ones. We are the light on a stand that gives light to all in the house. We have a city set on a hill that can't be hidden. We don't take a light and put it under a basket. No, I'm going to let it shine. This is who we are. We are that prophetic city within a city, community within a community, a family that welcomes others into our family. The way that we engage in or don't engage in sex Although we have, under God's grace, maybe the everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial for me, covering of his grace, we want to flee that kind of sexual immorality because the way that we engage in sex is a prophetic witness to those around us of who is our master. It's not our flesh. It's not my desires. My desires are not my master. My body is not my master. Like Paul says, I believe figuratively, I beat my body into submission. I bridle my proclivities, my desires, my cravings, and I direct them to where I want them to go. I'm not subject to them. They are subject to me and my master, who is Jesus. We bring our lives into line with his good order. And again, we don't look down on other people who live, who don't know Jesus, who live differently to us or who live disordered lives. They're not our enemies. They're not enemy combatants. They are slaves of the enemy. They're POWs. Jesus has sent us into the world to liberate with the power of his gospel. So we don't look down on them. And so the kicker, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. And so Paul just like machine gun finishes off this thought before again another significant chapters on the way. He says uh, a bunch of these things. He says, if you want to take this wonderful gift of God seriously, if you want to bring God glory with every aspect of your life, including sin, uh, including sex. He says, remember, sexual sin is a sin you commit against yourself. So where other sins, like he he goes on, he says, um, elsewhere he's talking, talking about those who are verbally abusive, uh, those kinds of things says those might be sins outside the body, but when you sin sexually, you're doing da- you're disordering your body. So that's where that's where the Holy Spirit lives. The Spirit lives in you. The Spirit who has done the refining, sanctifying work of setting us apart. He lives there. Don't desecrate His temple. It says you've been purchased at a great expense. So don't take damaging liberties with something that doesn't belong to you. Doesn't belong to you. And lastly, he says, so glorify God with your body as if all the rest weren't enough in their own right and their cumulative value weren't already enough for us to say, yes, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna live this way. And even as I do this with my hands, you notice it's kind of, there are, there are boundaries. So we're saying we are deliberately not engaging in freedoms. We might be able to, because of the grace we have, in order to live in God's ordered way, as God's ordered people, as those set apart and sanctified for Him. That's enough on its own, that we bring God glory with our bodies.
He, he is worthy. He deserves it. So we're going to be spending the next few weeks in chapter 7, which again we'll go into further detail, more about sex, more about marriage, singleness, divorce, virginity, and heaps more. Heaps more. It's going to be, uh, again, my hope is a very clarifying, very helpful month or so um, in, in, in the letter. Now, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s, uh, right in the kind of the heart of the, of the purity culture movement. Uh, and my wife tells me that I missed most of it and have no concept that there's a whole generation of people who've grown up, particularly who've grown up in the church or have grown up around the church, for whom the message of the 80s and the 90s in the church was incredibly unhelpful at best and damaging and destru- like destructive at worst. And that the, 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 the damage lingers. Like it's not that it stayed in the 90s. Like what happened in the 90s stays in the 90s. <laughs> Thankfully off of social media. But those people grew up and started to teach their own sons and daughters. Or became youth group leaders or ministers or older people who had their own hurts and griefs because of how even passages like today have been mistaught and misused and, and even abused. And so we're going to do a lot, of, a lot of the work of kind of pulling at some of those threads and disentangling what is helpful, what is good, what is God glorifying and holy and honoring. And some of those things that are harmful and unhelpful and have just made us under the mastery of something else that has a veneer of holiness. We're going to be doing that work over the next month and I hope it's going to be, again, wonderfully liberating for us. I spoke to a pastor last year who he'd be in his mid-40s and he said, man, my interstate guy, so my, I've just realised that I've been treating my wife horribly for 15 years, thinking that I was owed something. Thinking that my demands were holy and ratified by Scripture, and I've just come to realise they're not, that I've made a mess of my marriage because they were believing things, they've received things, they were teaching things and applying things in their own lives that they thought came from Scripture that instead led to a fractured marriage, broken heart, unmet expectations, unhelpful and damaging demands. And so what we're going to do over the next month is see in Scripture how can we you know, pull on all those threads and, and kind of see what does God's good, righteous rule and reign, his order look like and how might we leave behind the things that we've had or, or lived in or taught or believed in the past and step into those things. It's going to be an awesome month. Let's pray together. And so Father, help us. Help us in how we think about all of the things we've spoken about today. Everything being beneficial for us, but not everything, sorry, everything being permissible, but not everything being beneficial. Not everything, in fact, everything being permissible, but not everything, not everything being a good master, but you are our good master. You've purchased us, you've redeemed us. You set us apart and made us holy. And so, Father, we want to live as holy people. We want to live in line with your Holy Spirit who speaks to us and guides us in line with your scriptures. We want to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus we see and hear and read about in his pages. We want to live in your good order. And so would you help us with food and with sex and with our wallets and with, it, with our attitudes, with all of our lives. Father, help us to bridle our desires and lead them to Jesus. We don't want to live disordered lives. We don't want to live ignorant lives of how you'd have us live. Father, help us to not be in any sense haughty or arrogant 
or think of ourselves as morally superior, but just great beneficiaries of your wonderful mercy and grace. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for making food. Thank you for making sex for us. Help us to engage in these things in a way that brings you glory, in a a way that is good for us, and in a way that prophetically shows the world a better way. We pray this in Jesus' holy name and for his sake, amen.